Chris, welcome to the World XP Podcast. This is episode number nine. Uh, super happy to have you on. Really weird. We we're just talking about deaf dogs, and I had never considered like our dog is sitting right there, but he's not deaf, so he'll jump at any little noise that he makes. And we were like, your dog just sleeps through yeah. anything. It's like, yeah, dude, she's chill. It's chill. <laughs> that's awesome, honestly. Because you foster, you foster them, don't you? No, we get we get them through a foster agency. Um, so we adopted her from foster parents. Eventually, we do would like to foster with that agency. Um, mm. Not at this current stage of life. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. All sorts of stuff is going on. But you uh, work for NBC Twenty Nine, uh, and so a lot of things that we want to jump into today, just general. Uh, Right, say the media. I know you and I have talked about using that term, the the media, to encompass yeah. everything. Because you used to be a newspaper guy at school, and now you've jumped into the to the TV business. So, when you you were producing, weren't you were producing before? Yes, yeah. For two years, I was doing web editing, so basically just putting articles on the website, and then for the other half of it, I was producing the actual shows. So. How did you kind of jump into into the journalism world? Because I remember when we lived basically next door to each other when we were freshmen, you were super into the into the sports the sports kind of journalism world. Where did that sort of where did that interest start start for you? Yeah, that that all started in high school. It's the journalism class. Actually, it was a mass media class, um, which was like the prerequisite for it. And they had journalism students come and talk, and they were like this is a great field. If you like it, you should consider it for a career. And it just kind of struck me right then. I was like, I do really like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't have any kind of career path in mind at that point. So I went through the rest of high school doing it. I went into college, you know, confident that, you know, that's the path I wanted to do. And I love sports. So if I can marry the two subjects, then, you know, yeah, that would be the win-win. Yeah. I never, you know, I never did specialize in sports media. I did a little bit in college, but um, yeah, that's how I kind of set on that path just, you know, early on. Yeah, that's super interesting because when we were, when we were in school, I would ask you questions about it because I had also considered doing it. But then I, in my head, I was like, it seems super competitive. I don't really like writing that much, like, the only people I see are the ones on TV and those are the ones who have really made it. And the chances of me getting to be the Skip Bayless to somebody, somebody else's Shannon Sharp or Stephen A. Smith is <laughs> minuscule at best <laughs> to say the least. And so I never really, I never really pursued it, but you, you stuck with it. And now you've got not necessarily into the sports journalism world, but now you've got yourself into, into that world. So the, sort of persistence, I guess, to stick through that has been, as, as we've known each other, it's been cool to see you stick with it. Because, like I I didn't, and I, I wouldn't have wanted to. Uh, yeah, you yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, you're right. It's a competitive field, especially if you do want to get into sports specifically. Like, that's, you know, just an easy, fun job. Um, but as, and, maybe we'll talk more about it in depth later, but like when you step into, you know, out of college, this field, you get paid very little. You work a lot of hours. You work not fun hours. And to climb the ladder, you got to put in years of grueling work to, you know, get to either a market, like assuming you start in like a small market and by market, I mean town. So like Charlottesville is where I am. That's a small market. Mm -hmm. uh, my goal is to, uh, you know, be on ESPN one day. I got to like work my way out of Charlottesville into a place like DC and then climb that ladder. Like the, it takes like decades to really mm -hmm. build your yourself up. So it, it yeah, it, it's a lot. Um, and that's not necessarily my goal at this point. My goal at this point is to just like provide for my family. I'm not, you know, thinking about moving, but at one point in time, I did have aspirations to like climb the ladder, be a, like, you know, work at ESPN, write for ESPN or something like that. Um, but I quickly learned that that ladder is a long, hard climb and not one 
that you know I'm into right now. <laughs> yeah, but what make because there's other industries where you hear like the hard like you gotta pay your dues and you gotta do this and you gotta do that and you gotta put in the hours. But whenever I talk to journalism people in general, especially sports sports journalism people, I always hear it the most from from them. And it strikes me as a little bit odd because it's not like one of those jobs where there there you would think there would be a limited number of spots. And and by limited I don't mean like there's unlimited, but in, in other industries there's like a cap on how many teachers there are, right? Like especially professors, like it's super hard to become a professor. Or like an NBA coach, like especially in the sports world, like there's a limited number of coaching spots because there's a limited number of teams. Whereas like a writer doesn't seem to be capped by that same sort of uh, logic. It's like if ESPN wants to hire another writer, they can hire another writer. So what makes what makes it so much worse in the sports journalism world than than the other ones? And by where worse is maybe not the right word, but harder, I guess. Yeah. No. I. I that's probably. I would say it's competitive for the money. So yeah, you're right. There's no shortage of like, like small town, um, like newspaper writers, or like if you want to join a blog and write for this blog or something like any, anyone in, um, with a little bit of background could step into something like that. But it's like, if you want to, you know, make good money doing this, if you want to get into six figures, if you want to write for the Washington Post or, you know, something like that, um, that's competitive. And like when a place like ESPN opens up a position, you have thousands of people in these small markets who, you know, have the same goal as you to like start small and then get there, mm -hmm. get to ESPN or something like that. And ESPN, you get an entry level job at ESPN. You're not talking about a big pay raise here. <laughs> Again, no. I have a friend um, who considered leaving his job right now because he got a part-time opportunity at ESPN. He ultimately didn't do it because he's married and has things to, you know, think about, but it was, he was about to pick up and move to Bristol for a part-time job um, because of what just having that on your resume looks like. Yeah. So it's, you know, it, it's something you gotta, you know, make sacrifices for. And then like 10 years later, you're reaping the benefits. So you gotta you gotta put your career at the forefront for a long time to make good money out of it and get where you want to be mm. you need a certain number of so when espn makes that hire for that spot that a thousand like thousands of people apply to do you know what what they're looking for the number one thing they're probably looking for is like where are you now me in charlottesville they're gonna be like whatever if i was in dc chicago or um, like Atlanta, something like that. Then they they'll like take a look at your resume for an entry level job. You know, you need like probably two years experience. Um, so you need two years of either an unpaid internship or a very you know low paying internship. Um, and then just the experience. If they're hiring a writer, how mm -hmm. many things have you written? If you're going to be on air or on radio, what have you done there? So having actual relevant experience. Um, but you're looking at like two years of like low pay mm -hmm. just for a shot at a big company for a little money still. So yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of, uh, you know, getting by for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this, I feel like I don't know if this is just me, but I feel like it's becoming harder due to the amount of independent people that are just like writing blogs now and the, the, the amount of like those big companies that we normally see aren't as like 10 years ago. It was like ESPN is the for, like sports center is, was it. And mm -hmm. now there's like all these other shows on Fox sports and some of the local like the local channels are getting good airtime now like the big 10 network and the acc network are starting to get airtime and i think some of those are ran by espn maybe i could be wrong but there's definitely more like nbc sports has become bigger with some of their with some of their sports shows i feel like it's becoming more diverse to the point where some of the 
I don't know, it, like it doesn't seem to be like the mountain, the mountain to like ESPN at the top seems to be kind of like flattening out a little bit. No, yeah, you're right. There's, and technology has made that possible because now you can stream, uh, you know, the Pat McAfee show. Have you mm-hmm. heard about that? Like he yeah. does, his, his is a live YouTube stream. You know, he's not on a network. He's not, and he like that he's independent in that sense. And technology gave him the ability to do that. You know, there's, um, the barstool. Um, yeah, Bleacher that's, Report, that's a great example. Barstool Bleacher Report, like people like are streaming things in ESPN and their advantage, but also disadvantage right now is that to watch them, you need a subscription and things like that. Whereas these other platforms, you just need the internet. Yeah. Um, so that's really in this cord cutting um, generation of ours um, has been able to consume these other sources um, because they don't want to pay for ESPN and they can get their fill of ESPN on, you know, social media or something or watch highlights. They don't need to pay whatever they need to a month um, just for the, you know, sports center. So, yeah. And there's plenty of people on YouTube putting together ha- package highlights of whatever sport you could just type in like any player of any sport. And as long as they're kind of big, some sort of highlight package will come up. Yeah. And so these other, these other places are just empowering, you know, like young people to start their own, their own podcast or their own website, their own blog to, you know, try to maybe pave their own path. So that way they don't have to do those years of unpaid internships or part-time jobs um, to get where they want to be. They, um, they do it themselves. They build their own empire and then it takes off and then it grows into something else. So um, you see that a lot too. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have like two different paths to where you want to be in that kind of industry. Yeah, I think Bleacher Report's a really good example because I remember when I was in middle school, they were kind of new, and I would look to them for all their NBA predictions, not not the bigger not the bigger sources. And then this last year, maybe two years ago, they had the Champions. They had exclusive rights to the Champions League, and mm-hmm. it was a little like website that started off that was like just writing like predictions for this league or that league. And now they had Tim Howard, uh, Stu Holden, and like a full on like halftime show with like big names for champ for the Champions League, and they had exclusive rights to the Champions League. Yeah, it's like you never would have thought, like when it started, that that little website would have had that deal put in place with UEFA, who's the the European uh, Soccer Federation. Yeah, my my dream job is is like that. So Flowtrap is this website that covers professional and college cross country and track, which is what I you know I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's like my passion. Um, but they're just a website. They don't they're not TV. They don't print anything. But they have this huge team of writers and broadcasters because they they have exclusive rights um, to broadcast you know college um, races or professional races. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get to the Olympics, that's, that's NBC and stuff. Yeah. Um, but like throughout the year, like running is a year round sport. It's not just the Olympics. So flow track is the one broadcasting all this and they're just a website. So, you know, that's, you know, if I can give you a glimpse of my dream job, like that's it. And that's, and that a thing like that has nothing to do with, you know, television or print. Um, and they started that website um, just, you know, covering, I think they wanted to cover like college rugby or something mm-hmm. and it just like grew into you know different little subsets um so your you know idea your little website or whatever you start could grow into something really big one day um and the internet's made that possible yeah flow track i've not heard of that so how do when they broadcast do they just stream they just stream yeah. the races yeah they stream it you got to subscribe to their website um um, and that, so their big umbrella is flow sports and underneath there's like flow rugby, flow cheerleading, flow track, flow that and there's a bunch of different stuff. Are they trying to fill that niche for some of the less like the less yeah. mainstream ones? Yeah, they're, they're trying to fill the niche of like athletes like me in college who had this obscure sport um, that has more of a cult following than more of a general following. Um, so rugby, yeah, cross you know, country has a cult following. That's it, for sure. <laughs> it does. Yeah. You're not like, you're not going to get an average Joe to watch cross country championships at the end of fall, but you're going to get former athletes themselves to watch it and spend money to watch it. 
Um, and same with like, you know, those other small sports. Rugby, rugby too, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Like being friends with you guys on the cross country team and being friends with some of the rugby guys, I would like go over to their apartments or whatever. And they're watching like rugby. And I'm like, how did you guys find that? It's like, Oh, well we found this one website that streams it straight from like wherever they were playing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you, if you are really into it, you'll go find it. And uh, these, these kind of knit like this flow seems to be filling that niche for, especially if it's reliable. Cause there's, there's plenty that aren't reliable. Like you yeah. click on the link and then like, it doesn't work or it's just like some random like dead screen that there's nothing on. So it's like to become a reliable source of streaming for a niche sport like that. I definitely think there's a market for it. I think there's a cap. There's a ceiling on that market. Yeah. But there's definitely a market for it, especially if they're going to go with like multiple, like you said, rugby, cross country, cheerleading, like yeah. there's, there's plenty of markets for that. Yeah. So if you, if you have an idea, you know, if you're listening to this and you have an idea of like, you know, something you want to cover and do it in a unique way, go for it. You never know how far it'll take off because that is just one of many examples of something that started small and grew into, you know, a big successful uh, operation. Yeah. So how would you get into a job like that? How would you, how would you, is it, do they, are they hiring like nor, like a normal company or is it, yeah, they're like a normal company now. Like, um, I've looked at their website many times at job openings and it's, you know, same as anything, just like, do you have a degree? Do you have relevant experience? Do you mm-hmm. have an interest in this? The big thing is you have an interest in it because it's such a niche thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the average Joe isn't, they're not going to hire the average Joe who doesn't give a rip about, you know, cheerleading or track. Um, because right. they're not passionate about it. They want to find people who are passionate about the sport, but also have the experience. Yeah. Um, so so we, you, would, you would be a fine been, candidate then. <laughs> you know, that's why it's like my dream job. Too bad it's in Texas. <laughs> they're not doing remote or like? No, no, they're, they're like based in like Austin, Texas. And they have, they have people like stationed in different states, um, I think, or something like that. Um, but, but no, um, yeah, it's in basically. One day. One day, maybe. One day, they find they found like a Richmond office or something like that. There we go. <laughs> All you. All right, flow, flow track. If you hear this, fine. <laughs> found the Richmond office for Chris. Great writer. You should hire him. It would make him happy. <laughs> uh, that's what, so. All right, so you're doing. Uh, you're at NBC Twenty Nine now, and you were doing the the production stuff before. So, so outside of the alternative sort of methods of media, I guess, like the flow track and like the bleacher reports of the world, when you're, when you're at an actual like TV company, like how, how, how does that, how is that, how is that structure? Like the structure of the, cause you have like the, the TV people and then you have the writers like you were writing and, and doing stuff for the website and you were producing and now you're in sort of the, the marketing mm-hmm. uh, aspect. So how does that organization, and obviously don't, you don't have to be too specific if you can't or, whatever but how does the organization kind of run and then pick which topics and stories that it wants to to cover yeah so the way it's structured in a in a macro sense is so we're an nbc affiliate but we're not owned by nbc we're owned by a company called gray television and companies like that can buy and run stations from all different um affiliates so gray has nbc 29 us they have abc7 they have cbs whatever so Mm -hmm. um it's not necessarily all nbc stations are owned by nbc that's not how it works um we run on an nbc channel um but we're not owned by them so how does that work the affiliation versus the versus the the ownership because if you if they have like different they have like an abc channel and a cbs channel and a fox channel or whatever all under this company that owns all you guys what's the affiliation for it, that's just your way of you know of getting your broadcast out there so when the station started you know it starts as, as an idea um and, or i think this one specifically it was like over the radio um mm-hmm. our station it was it was very small very humble beginnings and then like eventually you contact nbc and say hey we have equipment we have people. Um, can we broadcast our show on your channel? Be- can we become an affiliate? And NBC mm-hmm. um, 
we'll, we'll say, yeah, um, you can become an established affiliate. Um, and then, you know, from there, your own, so we start off as like a small family owned company because it was built from the ground up. Um, but right. then in the past year we were bought by this big, uh, conglomerate, um, in gray television. And those are the ones that actually sign our paychecks. Those are the ones that, you know, hire people Our human resources goes through them. NBC is just the channel we're on. Um, when, when it's not our local news broadcasting, it's, um, NBC nightly news. It's um, Sunday night football. That's NBC. It's Wheel of Fortune. That's NBC. right. So, it you know if you have if you in in Charlottesville if you're on Channel Twenty Nine, you will get our newscast at noon at five p.m. at six p.m. whatever time we broadcast and all other times a day, you get regular NBC programming. Okay, so that makes so it's just a way for you guys to get more content that people are familiar with to kind of up like uptick your viewership. Yeah, like somebody's going through the guide and it's like NBC. It's like, oh, okay, they're they're doing Sunday Night Football. That's cool. I'll watch it. Our, and then you get yeah. Our update. advantage, our advantage of being an NBC affiliate is that NBC has really strong programming around the board. Mm -hmm. um, CBS probably has you know good sitcoms, but. NBC has, like you said, Sunday Night Football. Kai. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Kai. Kai. All right, and we're back. Dylan, if you want comedy, feel free to not edit that out. <laughs> um, Sorry, so go ahead. I lost our train of thought, but... NBC has uh, yeah. So programming. the advantage, yeah, the advantage of us is that NBC just has strong programming. Um, when we're not, when our station is not broadcasting, the the programming around it is strong. So that way, if you're just at home watching TV, um, you see what's good on TV. Oh, um, I like Wheel of Fortune. I'm gonna put on NBC, um, or I like nightly news. So I'll put on NBC, and then you just you breed you build that loyalty to that channel and then the local news comes on um so that's the advantage that's why you don't want to be that, that's why you want to be on an affiliate like a yeah. big one like us um there's fox there's abc um and in different markets it varies you know which station has the biggest um you know loyalty uh in the area it just so happens that here in a, in a lot of the country, NBC is the one with the most. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So when you're doing the, so then when you're doing, so you guys have what? You guys have the website, the articles for the website, then you guys have your local news stuff, which consists of what sports, weather, news in general. And yeah. then are those the two kind of big, big ones? Yeah. So now, so I gave you kind of a macro view of what it looks like in a micro sense in our building. Um, it's broken down. It's funny. Our building is broken down three floors, which is fitting because there's kind of three tiers of the, um, of the whole operation and not every building is split into three floors, but to give you an idea. So, um, one floor is news. Those are the reporters, the producers, the editors, the photographers, the mm -hmm. people who are actually going out and getting the things that will actually be on the news and be on the website. Right. Um, and then you have a lot of other background folks, like the web master who controls the website and things like that, um, the news director, the assistant directors, things like that. Um, on another floor, you have production. So this is like master control. People who right. are actually flipping the switch about what goes out on air. Um, they control the commercials, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the actual director who's down there um, taking the cameras as they come on air, um, audio control, uh, mm -hmm. graphic control. So the more nitty gritty, the engineers mm -hmm. um, actually, you know, working to get our signal out there, the nitty gritty. And then another floor, the one I'm on now is more sales and marketing and promotions and programming. Um, the ones who try to you know, get out there and bring in the money um, mm -hmm. to make our station more profitable. Mm. Yeah. So you were you were on the production floor before. Yes, I was. Yeah, you know, I was on the news floor, 
and now I'm on the sales floor. So what is it like, what's it take to kind of, okay, you guys are broadcasting in three, two, one, go. Obviously all there's, the, there's all the preparation before, but when it's crunch time, what does it kind of, what does it kind of look like? Like you get into this, into the studio, you set your, your equipment up and then what's it kind of look like from there? Yeah. Um, so in real time, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. So at noon, so right around now we are, you know, actually it's a Saturday, so we're not, <laughs> um, but we were, on a normal day, so noon is when we start our noon newscast. Um, right before that is the Today Show, um, I believe. Yes, yeah, the Today Show. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going out on air. Um, and then the guy in Master Control, as soon as that's over, he will flip that switch. And then our programming goes out there. And that's, that's when the director comes in. So whatever he has up on his big screen is what's going out on air. Mm -hmm. As long as master control, you know, has that, that switch flipped. Mm -hmm. that, and now we're taking over the signal. Um, the default is, you know, national NBC programming. Um, but when we flip our switch, we are on air. Um, and yeah, so then the director, that's his job. He's flip, he's clicking which screen to take, which camera to take. Mm -hmm. as it's happening um the anchors read their scripts um that and that's what the director goes off of he's reading the script and then there's camera commands in there and that's what i was doing so i was producing i would um edit scripts and then i would put in take camera three or take this clip or take this video take this sound bite and that's telling the director what to do next because he's just reading that script Mm -hmm. um, not just the words on paper, but the actual commands. Um, and then he would take that. Um, and if everything's done right, he would take the right video. He would take the right sound bite, and we would just go from there. Mm. Pressure. Don't yeah, mess it up. Yeah. They have the hardest job because mm -hmm. during the actual newscast, it's just constant. Um, where my old job, um, when I was producing, the hard work is all done beforehand. And then during the show, I just kind of sit back and make sure the timing of everything works out right um, if an anchor read slow or there's a technical difficulty or an anchor read too fast or something mm -hmm. we have to improvise but i'm just hitting i'm just like hitting a button as we go along and the program is telling me you know you're 30 seconds heavy you're 30 seconds light mm -hmm. and you, we want to hit at the end of our newscast we want to hit right on time because we will go directly into um the tonight show or not the today show or um whatever is on next yeah whatever's on next we don't want to go heavy because you know we don't want to cut off lester holt um <laughs> when, he, when he's doing his introduction to nightly news you know i i that was my biggest faux pas one time i, I was producing a show and it was early on which i saw very little like knowledge of what i was doing but like mm -hmm. our show ended like 10 seconds late so in real time if you're at home watching we go there's an abrupt ending from us and then lester holt in the middle of talking because he he'll he'll start at his normal time no matter what it's, yeah it's like 6 30 and like seven seconds or something like that it, it's exactly so it's down it's down to the second then it is down yeah it is down to the second and nbc like big nbc will tell all of its affiliates um, this is the time this is starting and here. Um, and that gets really tricky. So if there's football on, mm -hmm. they can't, they can't say exactly when they're going to end. Yeah. Um, so that's when you have to really listen for this, for, from NBC to tell us when that time is going to be. Um, and same with like a special report, like mm -hmm. when Trump's impeachment was going on, mm -hmm. there was, um, oh my gosh, that was happening this year. <laughs> it feels like so long ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's special reports. So that means that they were, they were on air at, at random times, like not normal programming, like at 2 PM in the afternoon, you're normally watching days of our lives or something like that. But during the mm. impeachment, you're watching a special report. Right. Um, and they, they, during that time, they communicate with the affiliates. It's like, we're, um, 
we're going to end here or something like that. So when, when you, when you, when you had your faux pas, obviously you were new. Was there a fault? Like, was there a fallout from that? Or was it just like, don't do that next time? It, it was, it was just a stern talking to from my boss. And then like, it just didn't happen. Like there were, there yeah. were no like repercussions though. A big NBC yeah. wasn't like you messed this up or whatever. Yeah, no, it's never, it's never an issue from the big NBC. It's more of an issue from uh, your bosses at the station because the backlash is people at home will be upset or, you know, say that your, your broadcast is, you know, messing up. Or yeah. That. Heaven it, forbid you miss, you miss seven seconds of Lester Holt. <laughs> it just doesn't, it just doesn't look clean. Right. Um, right. So like, that's the biggest fallout from that. Mm. And if, well. it, if it were to happen on a consistent basis, then big NBC might be like, Hey, we have a problem. Yeah. Mm hmm. So, well, I'm glad you didn't get in too much trouble. <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't tank, didn't tank your career. No, but like that, to give you an idea, it's like that kind of thing is like it's down to the second, mm -hmm. and it's it's very like just being aware of timing and things like that. So yeah, yeah. it definitely gives you a different perspective of how, how precise you have to be, and then the anchors as well. Because if you like, if you're like thirty seconds ahead or behind, do you tell the anchors to like, hey, delay this or like draw this yeah. part out longer? Yeah, you, you communicate with them. And after a while, you get an idea of how long the talk, the anchors talk, or sometimes they'll just like cross talk and improvise. And mm -hmm. so there are some shows where I would like to stay 30 seconds light consistently throughout because I know at some point they're going to improvise or the weatherman is going to go longer than usual mm -hmm. um, to kind of just give me that extra time. Um, there's other ones where I want to be a little bit heavy because sometimes they don't talk as much or sometimes they end sooner than they should or you know just having because it's easier to kill stuff you know mm -hmm. all I gotta do is click click a thing and it says it, it'll float it so it takes it out of the script it takes it out of the video cue and everything mm -hmm. um, and then that adjusts the timing whereas if we if something happens and some, suddenly we're two minutes light in the middle of a show that's a lot harder to, you know, make up on the fly. You can, yeah. I can't just tell my weatherman, hey, do two extra minutes of weather because he didn't prepare for that. He would just be repeating himself again or something like that. Yeah. Um, or I could tell master control, hey, uh, play some station promotions or uh, commercials um, to make up for this time. Like that's kind of an emergency situation. Um, but those are like the options in that um, in that case. So when, when you guys are in there and you're like a minute ahead, ahead or behind, like when I'm watching or when I was watching TV, I think I can probably count on one hand the amount of times where I was like, that didn't seem right. Somebody messed up in the studio. Like if you guys mess up in the studio, are there, do you, do you guys just have, have you guys have done it enough to like kind of make it seem like it wasn't a mess up? Or you guys just not mess up? No, no, there's definitely mess ups. Um, but it's it's not too often where it's noticeable to the average person. Um, mm -hmm. It's normally a situation where we adjust it behind the scenes and it's clean on air. Um, but we know behind the scenes. So now, like before I had that job, I would watch the local news and never find anything wrong with it. But now, knowing what I know, I could watch the local news and be like, oh, they um, they didn't put in the right graphic or, oh, this happened because they were too heavy. Or, you know, I can yeah. notice these things because I was behind the scenes. But if you're just at home, most, most of the time, you're not going to notice the, the little small mistakes that are made um, to where the people behind the scenes are like, oh, it shouldn't have been that way. Um, but people at home are like, whatever. Yeah. So... I want to jump to, I was thinking about this earlier after we talked on Friday, Thursday, Friday, whatever day it was. Um, Cause I was listening to a Rogan podcast and they brought up the, um, remember the, the Covington kids, that kid that was like wearing the MAGA hat and he was smiling and then the native American and then CNN ran a story that he was harassing the native American. Yeah. 
and then he sued and won a bunch of money because that was a lie. Um, how, from from your perspective, how does something like that happen? Like how how does like if because when we were talking before, because I asked you a, a kind of similar question, and I wasn't trying to trap you with the answer then. I really just wanted to know how you how you were talking to me was like, yeah, we like we make sure we do the research and we make sure like, yeah, we, we might have a slight bias here or there, but we don't like, we try and make sure we have all the facts. Right. And so how does, how does that, how does something like that happen? And we don't have to spend a lot of time on, on this. Yeah. Um, but it's like, that's like one of the biggest news news sources in, in the world probably. And they just, it just wasn't at all accurate. Yeah, so when we're deciding on like what to cover and how to cover it, the the only thing your primary thing is the facts, um, obviously. And when you get into gray waters or touchy situations, you that's when you know your journalistic integrity is tested. And that's when you take classes on it. That's that's what you're taught about is journalistic integrity. Um, that if you were to step completely outside of any affiliations you have, um, how do you feel about this subject? Um, so as a local news state sh station, there's little reason for us to talk about, um, I, until it became as big as it was, uh, like a Jacob Blake shooting mm -hmm. um, or something like that, or what you were talking about, the Covington kids. There's a little reason for us to talk about that until it becomes national conversation, until it starts to be talked about by people in our town. Mm -hmm. um, because as local news station, like, again, right after people watch our news, they're going to watch the national news. So there's no point in us talking about the same thing they're going to talk about. The, our mission and our goal is to inform people of what is going on in our town. Um, and then when it does get to a point that, you know, we should talk about this thing, we are taking that information directly from NBC, mm -hmm. um, because that's our, you know, that's our parent, um, not our parent company because that's great television, but you know, that's the trick. That's down. right. Um, or CNN is also a partner of ours. So we'll gather information from CNN. Um, and the Associated Press. Um, I would say in order of like hierarchy or like um, like how often we source those places, um, it would be NBC, AP, and way down just more CNN. Um, we we pull from CNN more if there's like a like a nice um, story that we want to like a. Like when I was doing the Sunrise Show, I had two and a half hours of news to fill. So sometimes I would have to find like a fluffy package about something and I could get it from NBC. And not NBC. Well, I could, but CNN. Mm -hmm. um, if I want like more of like the hard, um, there's a package on President Trump and his impeachment going on. There are reporters from big NBC mm -hmm. that make packages that the affiliates can use and pull and use that. Um, so most often we're not um, gathering the information ourselves um, when it becomes, when it's, we're talking about like a national story, we're more like using what has been created by um, someone else and putting it in our broadcast. Sure. For example, like Tracy Potts is a reporter for NBC News. Um, mm -hmm. you'll, if you watch the Today Show, she'll be on there very often. Um, but she also like will make packages that are available for the affiliates to use. And that was one mm. of the things that I had the option of doing was like, I had this website and, and the website was a big pool of stories that we can use and put into our broadcast. Um, we pulled the video, we pulled the scripts and put it right in there. Um, so when it's a national story, it's not directly us, um, making shooting the video and making the scripts and stuff sure um, it's our news judgment um that comes into play it's like should we take this yes is it relevant to the people here yes and then when it is relevant or like if it's uh 
a story going on here, that's our reporters, that's our um, photographers going out, shooting that, um, interviewing people for it, um, and that, that's all done normally. Um, but when we're talking about what you're talking about, like more controversial situations, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's more just like a judgment call. Um, and it get, sometimes it gets to the point where, you know, you can't not report on something. Um, like when George Floyd, grew into what it was yeah of course at, at the very beginning it wasn't it wasn't about charlottesville it, it, but it got to a point where it it was mm -hmm. uh, not everywhere it was about every black person in america yeah so i guess my question was, was more not how you guys deal with that specifically but how somebody brings that story into cnn and they say hey uh mm -hmm. these kids were harassing this native american guy and there's like no one no one thought to be like, let's double check this before we put it on the national news. Like how my question was more, mm -hmm. how does, how does that happen? And for me, uh, I know it annoys you because we've, we've yeah. talked about it before, but how does something like that happen with a company that's so with an outlet that's so big? Because so you're talking, yeah, you're talking about the actual origin. Of yeah. it happening in the moment. And that's, well, that's how smartphones have changed everything because now everyone is a journalist because they have firsthand witness to police shootings, to rallies, to things like that. But the, th the problem with that is you don't have all the context. Um, as a news station, the only thing you can say is what you can see in the video. Like if, if a video on Twitter goes viral, like the George Floyd one was, or a photo like the Covington kids one was, all you can, talk about is what you see there. Um, unless you had a reporter there asking people um, questions and witnessing the, what led up to these things, um, then you can't, you can't speculate on it. Um, you can only um, wait for more information to come out. Um, so, and it, it does become a problem. Like, you know, you know, maybe CNN shouldn't have, you know, done that maybe not exercise the best judgment. Um, but that's where you just got to be really careful about what you say and make sure you have all the facts before you report on stuff. Well, wouldn't um, it be on them to go to go ask the question? Be like, hey, yeah. like to go figure it out before they air it? Yes. Yeah, it would. And if they don't, um, that's on them. And they, they that's, there's a new, there's a saying in news, you you rather be right than be first because if you're first to put out something and it's wrong, there's, there's hell to pay. But if you wait a little bit and make sure you get it right, that's all that matters. Um, there's a pressure to always be the one to put out the information first. Mm -hmm. um, and you're the one that breaks it, but that means nothing if you get it wrong or it means nothing if you didn't say it accurately or tell the story accurately. Um, so, and when you see people on social media say that they have a problem with people not talking about this or, you know, nobody's reporting on this, there's, they're not, not reporting on it. There's just no information other than this video or this photo. Um, and that's, you know, everyone wants to avoid what happened to CNN because they don't want to jump to conclusions. They don't want to, you know, say what just if you scroll on Twitter, they don't want to report on just what people are saying. They can only report on what officials are saying or like what their reporters see and hear for themselves. Um, so, you know, when people bash the quote unquote big media um, for not doing their jobs, it's not that they're not doing their jobs. There's just, you know, there's only so many eyes that they can trust and ears that they can trust. They can't source things off their Twitter feed. Yeah, so yeah. everyone is, they want to avoid a CNN situation where, you know, CNN sure. waited, or not, didn't, didn't wait. Um, well, that's what I'm saying. How, how does that, like, obviously everybody wants to avoid that situation. I don't think anyone is like, yes, let's go report incorrect news. I'm, I'm saying, how, how does that get through the height, like through the chain of command and to be like approved, yes, we're going to air this when we don't know what happened. 
it's, it's that pressure of being first, you know, people, that's wanna, what it is. Yeah. People want to be the one to break the news. People, you know, want visits to their website and, you know, build trust with them um, because you said it first, but um, I sometimes that's what happens when you don't wait long enough. Fair enough. That, Fair that, that's like when, when Kobe Bryant died, mm -hmm. um, it was TMZ that yeah. first reported it. Mm -hmm. And TMZ doesn't have the best reputation. They will say things just really fast. And to their credit, they report on things pretty well, just very fast. So like, they also got the Ray Rice beating. You know, they got that. I remember that. They get, they get a lot of the athlete, like the athlete, athletes in trouble with the cops or athletes like the, the yeah. like scandal sort of stories. Yeah. I, I don't know how. Um, they have they have the right sources, I guess, but you know, some, they, a lot of the times will report on something too fast or it's inaccurate. Um, and the Kobe Bryant, um, death was, was an example of, yes, they were first and yes, they were right in the end. And I think as details came in, they reported their numbers were a little off than it should have been. Um, but they kind of broke a lot of journalistic laws and that they didn't wait for official police. You know, they have, they went out immediately and said, Kobe Bryant, they didn't, yeah. wait for, they didn't wait for confirmation um, from sources, uh, uh, from officials. They just went with their sources. Yeah. Cause I remember that. I remember seeing a notification pop up on my phone, like Kobe Bryant died from TMZ. And I was like, oh, TMZ said it. I really like, yeah. and then like the next one came in and it was like, it started to be like, NBC, Fox, and I was like, yeah. oh no, it's true. Yeah. But like when TM TMZ first came in, I was like, whatever. That's why you gotta be so careful about how you're consuming your news. So last night, I go on Facebook, and the first thing I see is Chadwick Boseman dies. Yeah. That, that just is so mind blowing. And the source I saw, it was like Seattle something. And I, like, I'd never seen it before. I was like, why is this showing up? So, and it was just such an out of the blue story. I was like, I have to double check this. So I Google it. Yep. The first one I see is Washington Post five minutes ago. Yeah. And dies, of course. Yeah. And that's when I was like, okay, this is real. Yeah. So you got to just make sure you're careful about that's what you're That's what I did as well. I saw an Instagram post to say that he died. And I was like, let me Google it. And then, like you said, the Washington Post was the first one that was up there. I was like, oh, 2020 sucks some more. <laughs> yeah, that was that was just so shocking. Yeah. Um, rest in peace. Well, yeah, let's get off some of the sad stuff. I think, so, let's see. So if we jump back into, into sports, the sports journalism, or the sports aspect of things for, for a second. Yeah. Um, so obviously the NBA is doing their bubble thing, and they they kind of they boycotted their games on Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday. Um, and then some of the the MLS teams, a lot of them followed suit. Uh, I think baseball had a couple that did as well. The WNBA. Um, NFL teams canceled practice. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Lions were the first one that that did that. So, mm -hmm. what's your so? As a, as a journalist, especially like you, you heard, um, I don't know if you heard Stephen A. Smith came, there was a players meeting, I think, with some of the owners uh, in the NBA. And mm -hmm. Stephen A. Smith came, came comes out of that and he says like the players weren't happy with how LeBron was uh, sort of presenting himself in that meeting. If you're a reporter in there, like does Stephen A. Smith have so, like, I'm going to take Woj aside because I've never seen Woj be wrong. He's always first <laughs> and he's always right. But yeah. The, but do journalists like Stephen A. Smith and like some of the some of the other ones like that have sort of a? He seems like he's got some. I don't want to use the word privilege, but he's got this like sort of like if he gets it wrong, it's kind of okay because he's Stephen A. Smith. Mm -hmm. Is that? So yeah, I saw that too, and I was, I was like, what? Where's that from? And yeah, it was Stephen A. Smith and. I know what you mean about like not necessarily privilege, but he, he has some, he has some clout um, because of his experience. Um, and he's a source where 
more times than not, I tend to trust because I do as well. Definitely. He's so tight with the players and he has sources, but the, the barrier we have with him is that he, his primary role at ESPN is to debate and to argue and to say inflammatory things, uh, hot takes. Um, yeah. Whereas Woj, like Adam Schefter, their only jobs are to report. You know, they are mm-hmm. just giving you facts, like cold hard facts as soon as they happen. So that's why like when we um, see what they say, we take it as gospel because they're never wrong and they're never, they never show their bias Mm-hmm. Uh, I can I can tell you what teams Woj and Adam Schefter root for. Um, yeah, me neither. But, but I know Stephen A. Smith is a is a Knicks fan, a Steelers yeah. fan. Um, so he wears that on his sleeve. So then you know we and he hates then, the Cowboys. And he hates the Cowboys. So you know the, then it, it just automatically there's a level of distrust that comes with that because um, he becomes human. Whereas we see Woj and Adam Schefter are just robots who don't sleep and have 10 cell phones. Whereas Stephen yeah. A. Smith has, you know, he has teams to root for. He goes to games. He takes vacation. Things like that. Yeah. Woj, is, Woj and Schefter are like fact reporting machines. Yeah. And when Woj, like, he sent an email to some senator or something like that that got him suspended by ESPN, people were like, like, people like me, like, what? He can do that? He has opinions? <laughs> yeah. Was, it's just weird. So yeah, it's hard to believe stuff when it's reported by a guy like Stephen A. Smith. Um, Even though he is quite trustworthy, though, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah, he is. Like I, I always, I trust what he says. Um, but it's just like different when it comes from him because mm-hmm. we expect that stuff from Woj. Also, you can kind of tell though when he's talking. You can kind of tell when he's like buckling down and being serious about something versus like when he's like got the cowboy hat on and he got the cigar. He's like, "How about them cowboys?" Like you can tell there's like, there's like two different Stephen A. Smiths. Like there's like the reporting Stephen A. Smith. Like when he comes out and is like, hey, the players didn't like how LeBron talked to them. And then there's the first take. I'm going to mess with Max Kellerman today, Stephen A. Smith. You can kind of tell, at least I can kind of tell the difference. I mean, maybe I, maybe I'm just crazy, but can you tell like when he's like. Yeah, I can, I, you can tell a difference. And, you know, he's a guy with so many different like levels of character that it, it, it's clear you know he talks in his in his slow low voice mm-hmm. he's serious he looks right at the camera mm-hmm. and then when he's you know on first take and they're debating he talks real high and really fast and that's that's when you can tell um yeah. when it's entertainment or information um yeah. and he plays that really well he rides that line really well mm-hmm. he does and I, I feel like often the news, the sort of LeBron news that we saw from him. Yeah. Usually I don't really, he's the only one that has that kind of clout where players are going to be like, hey, I didn't like this thing that so-and-so said in private. And he never reveals who it was. And he never says like who told him or <laughs> what exactly what was said. He just says, hey, I know this. and But it's only him. Because Woj doesn't really report on that sort of stuff that much. Woj is like, this player was traded. Or this player signed here. Or this player's in talks with here. Like with, with this team. Stephen A. Smith gets the more like emotion, emotional reporting almost. Is that mm-hmm. like the, what, what they're feeling? Or like what, so what he expects to come because so and so is feeling a certain way about this thing. Mm-hmm. And is that sort of a niche that you like as a reporter you can jump into at, as like, or is that just kind of based off their personalities and their sources? It, it, yeah, it's based off, like you said, personality and sources. So Woj's sources are all front office people. They are um, partners. They are business, they're business partners, um, mm-hmm. people who know about decisions before they're made. Um, Stephen A. Smith's sources are the players the um, coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, and so his reporting is a little trickier because because of that emotional level. Like his, his risk in reporting that about LeBron is that he now can LeBron talk to Stephen A. Smith in confidence or can LeBron, can LeBron trust Stephen A. Smith as, you know, someone he can talk to about stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you hurt feelings in, in that, in that way. Um, and it, it's all about, yeah, your personality. And you can get into a niche. Um, 
based on your personality, if you're a very trusting guy, mm-hmm. a very um, and a very talkative um, individual, extroverted. That's the word I'm looking for. Extroverted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can be a Stephen A. Smith and have sources on the inside, and you can give the more emotional side of reporting. Um, whereas if you're more introverted, um, then you know you can take advantage of that and you know talk to just people uh, over a cell phone and the front mm-hmm. office people. Yeah. Um, and I not to call Woj in, introverted because he is on TV twenty four seven and. Mm-hmm. talks to people all the time um but he's not getting an emotional connection with he, his reporting doesn't rely on emotional connection like Stephen a smith right um, also when he was on yahoo he was never on tv really yeah oh yeah he, he was a faceless guy um yeah. he was this, this faceless uh twitter god <laughs> yeah that's, that's <laughs> what he was and then we went to espn and you first see his face he's like oh my gosh this is whoa <laughs> he exists he's real <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, I think Stephen A does a really good job of that, though, because he'll come tell you things that people have told him in confidence and not and reveal just enough to make it worth talking about, but not mm-hmm. enough that the players' trust in him uh, erodes based on what he's saying. Yeah, I think as the that role that he fits in the NBA, I think is really, I mean, it's, it's impressive to me. Like the more I think, like the more I talk to you and other people in the journalism world. The more I think, like, I know there are definitely people that don't like him because they say he only yells, which maybe is true. <laughs> but the, like, I don't, I don't know if you agree with this, but the level of reporting that he does on, on the subjects that he does and then maintains the relationships that he has is really impressive to me. It is. It, it is. And it, it takes a long time to build that level of trust to where you can push the envelope like he does, but still maintain that trust. It mm-hmm. takes a long time. Um, and you know, he's earned it. Um, it, it is very impressive. That's where he is, right? Where he is now and making the money he is now. Yeah. It's, well, then, then there's Skip Bayless who the players flame on Twitter all the time for saying dumb things. Yeah. So, so he, he can't, Stephen A. Smith can maybe get away with saying dumb things sometimes because A, he'll own it when he's wrong. Which he does. Not, yeah. Which he's not wrong that often. No. Um, he'll own it, but also, his takes are informative, mm-hmm. um, which is why he's not wrong very often. Whereas Skip doesn't, you know, he's not sourcing his takes directly from the people. They're just from his own silly brain. Um, so when he's wrong, he's wrong. And he's really he wrong. Make, he make it known. Um, and he doesn't have the trust to fall back on. Yeah. He, he didn't build that trust over time. Like Steve. Yeah, I think he's fallen into the more the entertainment side. I don't think he does that much actual reporting anymore. Oh, yeah, no, he's just he's just fun to listen to. Like, it's fun to just watch Santa Sharp just beat him up. Skip! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, once you get, I mean, if I'm, if I'm Skip, though, I'm not doing any real reporting anymore, though, either. No, you, you've made your money. You're you're old, just, you know, make, yeah, sit back, have your nice cushy uh, debate show in the morning and go home to your wife. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to put in the man hours and Fox, they're not the ones, um, their niche right now isn't reporting. It's, you know, debate shows and in sports. you mean? Uh, yeah. In sports. Yeah. Fox is, yeah. Fox sports. They're not, you know, out there breaking news. They're out there um, putting out just Twitter content and video content. Mm-hmm. Um, debate content there's just entertainment they call him coward sometimes he'll report stuff um if you listen to his show it's it's more like he had he'll give you an unnamed source and say they're telling me this um and he's not breaking the news but he's saying like i have a really reliable source he's saying this mm-hmm. watch out for this yeah um and he, he was really right about i think i think it was Maybe it was LeBron to the Lakers, but and people saw that coming from a mile away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he, it, it's like that, you know, he's not pushing that envelope with, you know, reporting. He's no. more so talking just his own opinion. Yeah. So the only times that there's like breaking stuff on his shows when he brings like Chris Bruce or one of those guys on as a yeah. guest for like 10, 15 minutes, but yeah, even he, so. He had, time, he had time at ESPN and people really like him. 
Um, Broussard or Coward? Chris, Chris Broussard. Yeah. Um, he had his time at ESPN and he built up a lot of credibility. Um, and he carried that with him to Fox, whereas Colin Coward, you know, he was kind of an unlike figure even while he was at ESPN. Yeah. So he went over to Fox and it really carried that like trust with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't heard a lot of, from Broussard lately, lately as much as I used to. Yeah, he's still there. I see him every now and then, but he did take kind of a hiatus for a little while. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. What do you think about the players boycotting the games? It's, I, I think it was the right move for them personally. Like, and I, until it happened, I didn't, you know, quite, you know, get their perspective on it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard for them being in that bubble. Um, and I'm one of those people who, you know, I, my first thought is you're making millions of dollars. You should be able to put, put up with anything and be happy and not complain. But, mm -hmm. you know, Chris Paul had a really good um, quote from the players meeting the other day where he's like, we're human. We have feelings. Um, he says more, but it's just like, and when you have that voice and you, and you're, you know, impacted emotionally by something like these police shootings and you're trapped in this bubble in Disney, mm -hmm. um, it's it's hard you feel trapped you feel like you can't do anything all you can yeah. do is um say what you can say at press conferences which is great um and i i hope that they continue to just use every mm -hmm. if they if they want use every opportunity they can to voice their opinions but i get how they would feel you know kind of helpless that yeah that, um, I, I would too if you're trying, they can't go anywhere they can't see anyone yeah. Like they've been with their team. How long have they been down there now? A month and uh, a half? Two months? Yeah, almost two months because they had to get, you know, go through pro quarantine protocol and everything. Yeah. Um, they've been down really, there by themselves for like for two months. Like yeah. the most, when you guys were on team trips, the most you were, you, you were gone for was like a week, right? Oh, a yeah. Week I, I mean, maybe the big teams, but we never got that kind of treatment yeah. across country. Well, we were gone like three days. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. So even, well, even like soccer, when we were going to showcases, like, yeah. for travel most would be gone is like four days yeah it's like i couldn't imagine being stuck with my team for two two months without being able to see any of my friends that weren't on the, more that like were not associated with the team or like yeah. your family or whatever like that'd be miserable and then you're not being able to because a lot of those guys were going to protest and stuff before mm -hmm. um before they went down there and so i think they're doing all they all they can really yeah. but i I'm also like if think about it, if you have kids. Yeah, and, you can't see your kids either. And, and when that happens, you know, you want to be able to hold your kid and tell him it's gonna be okay. Or mm -hmm. like talk him talk him through that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you know he sees he or she sees another black person shot um on camera, um, you want to talk him through that. And that's really yeah. hard when you're LeBron and you're on the opposite side of the country and you can only talk to them through Zoom. Yeah. It's hard. That's not ideal. One of the other things that it made me think of, though, is like they're doing the, the NBA, especially, is doing all they can to develop mm -hmm. the players. But I wonder what this gets, what this gets in terms of a social, because I feel like most of the fans are like are on the same page with them already. Like the the league, like the NBA, is one of those leagues where everybody's already on the same page. Yeah, m most <laughs> mostly, and so I wonder what this what this gets. It gets like. Because the only thing that I saw on social media was player like people who are already fans of the NBA being like, yes, this is a good step that they did this. And then those like few scattered in people that are like, I'm never watching the NBA again. And it's like, okay, well, you weren't watching the NBA in the first place. So like, congratulations, you made your stand that you're not going to change your behavior. So like, I almost wonder, like, I feel like the NFL and like baseball are, are the leagues that would reach more of the people that need to be reached maybe yeah yeah and that's that's totally right um the nba doesn't have a problem because their their audience is young and diverse um and young diver diverse people are less likely to have these issues of racism i'm not saying it doesn't exist um i'm not saying we don't have you know we don't all have learning to do but mm -hmm. yeah they're more so preaching to the choir but the great thing about um you know social media and um just the, the 
platform that these people have now is that they're not just an NBA player isn't just talking to NBA fans anymore. Right, they're talking uh, about more than that. And that, and people across sports, because of social media and things like that, are friends with each other. Um, so, you know, Russell Wilson is friends with people in the NBA, and he'll take those ideals and influence his team with them. Yeah. Uh, and we, we've seen that. We've seen that progress. The, like the NBA, the, you know, they're the ones who are kneeling, and it, now it's commonplace. Um, now it's not like you have to explain yourself if you're not kneeling, but you might. Ex- you should expect like a question from a media member. It's like, why weren't you kneeling with your team? Yeah. Um, like it's your right to do whichever, um, as long as your intentions are good. You know, if you're if you have malicious intentions by not kneeling, okay, then maybe. But anyway, um, in the NFL, you know. Even a year ago, you can imagine a player kneeling without, you know, hell to pay. Um, but like Roger Goodell has already come out and said, I'm going to support any player that kneels or any team that decides to kneel. Yeah. And that is a large part of the NBA. If the NBA didn't pave that path or like set that precedent, um, then the NFL wouldn't have the pressure on them to do that. Same with like the MLB. Mm-hmm. Um and NASCAR, when they banned Confederate flags, that was huge. Yeah. NASCAR are just redneck white people, not Jess, but like, mostly. That's, that's a Southern sport. Yeah. So banning Confederate flags, you're going to anger a lot of the people that you serve. Um, and again, that's the voice of the NBA and the influence they have. Mm-hmm. With that young audience, like our generation, it's loud um, and they, we dominate social media. So when the NBA influences them, and now this is the norm, these other sports are going to follow suit because they want to keep that generation of audience. You know, they don't, they don't want to isolate them. Yeah. Um, so the NBA is doing, yeah, what they can. And it, you know, their ultimate goal, their end game, like you said, is to, you know, influence not just the other sports. I mean, right now, all they can all they hope to do is influence the other sports, but just, mm-hmm everywhere else too um but it starts with right now as sports come back and everyone's watching because we all want to watch something um it starts there yeah definitely i think maybe it's not my place to say but some of the stuff that comes out of the nba though like some of the some of the players like the tweets that i read i'm like did you like i know what you're trying to say did you think about that before you tweeted it and it's there are there are some you know like when Montrez Harrell, like, um, did you see what he? Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's definitely like you know, people don't think before they speak or before they tweet. Um, yeah, what yeah. is it? It's to be, to be careful from the standpoint of like, we want we want to make sure that, like, we're all pushing for the same the same thing. Yeah. As far as a a more uh, equal society, right? Like where the color of your skin shouldn't doesn't matter shouldn't matter Mm -hmm. and some of the stuff is like i don't i don't have an example off the top of my head i remember the emotions think like the emotions that i thought like i would see some tweets and i'd be like that's not that's not what that's doing that's pushing for like this and that or like the like the all cops or what the acab thing Mm -hmm. and it's like you guys have such a platform like be careful more careful maybe they're doing a really good job though by and large like i'm not it's just in general like if you have that type of type of platform like something that you say like you hear people say that like trump incites violence and the tweet maybe might not may or may not do it but it's the same thing the other way around it's like you need to make sure that one person can like interpret your what you said as a super negative thing like okay this this player said that we need to abolish the police so i'm gonna go shoot this cop it's like one person one person could say that so it's just like the amount of people that they're reaching is really good but by the same token i think they know most and like i said most of them know maybe this is just a small gripe that i have but i remember feeling that feeling like when reading it i was like 
Yeah, and that's like when I talk about the pros of social media, those are the dangers of social media because mm -hmm. um, everything you say is amplified now, especially when you're a professional athlete. So when you um, say things out of emotion or you say things that, um, you know, maybe you know, aren't the right ideals, like I agree with you, all cops aren't bad. Um, or, you know, we shouldn't abolish police. You know, we should maybe reallocate funding um, I, I, what I have seen are like some of the you know, funding of police departments. And I agree, we could put more of that into education, but by like, those aren't the you know, real solutions. Um, and so that's where the danger of social media is. And that's, yeah. if you're the MBA, you want the voices to be those level headed people like Chris Paul. Um, yes. The, Love the, Chris the Paul. Players yeah. Association. So th it was so great that the other day, the players union and um, the owners, they had that joint meeting and there was just a lot of honest, deep conversation. Um, and the voices that come out of that are like the level-headed ones like Chris Paul. Mm -hmm. um, like that's conversation is so powerful. So when the players are talking to each other, um, people can speak truth into each other, um, support one another. Um, rather than like if everyone's just like going off on social media, you know, people will say things and yeah. take them the wrong way. Um, and then you have a large group of people who become against the NBA if a lot of the players are saying maybe ill-educated things. So mm -hmm. um, that's where the power of conversation is. Um, and if you're the league, again, you just want the right players, yeah. you know, speaking on behalf of the league um, and understanding that, all these players are individual people and that they're um, right for sure. Yeah. Their tweets aren't representative of the whole league or even the whole team. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, making, you know, drawing that line and saying like people can say what they want and believe what they want. Um, but here's what we believe as a team, as a league. Um, and here's what we're going to work to for. Yeah. It's which almost like, great, which is great. Like they're, they're all voting like right now in the NBA, they're all registering to vote. Um, mm -hmm. And they're turning their, um, arenas into polling places i saw that as well that's really good yeah so like just going after the right um initiatives is has been great to watch yeah so yeah like so the next steps i would say like turning the turning the arenas into, into voting places like yeah. huge it's a really good thing it's like so that i would say that and like the next step would be then to meet with the mayor or city councils of whatever cities they're in and try and enact that change that they want but I, I said this on one of the first podcasts, right? It's like, there's no, the city council people or the mayors or the governors, when they're trying to enact this reform, there's not really a set of like uh, demands from, from the, the movement. It's like, we want, like, there's not specific things that they want. So when they're trying to enact this legislation, they're kind of just making it up as they go. So if the, if the NBA were to were to sit down with experts like policy experts, like some economic experts, like some some people that like have done the research, right? Not just I'm not saying like JaVale McGee should start making policy, <laughs> but like if the teams were to sit down with experts in those fields and and then to take this information to to the like the the city governments say, hey. These are the experts that we've talked to. We agree that this would be a good, such and such idea. They have our backing. Please do something like this. Yeah, I think that would be a good a good next step for um, for a lot of them because I because I you've probably you've been on Twitter so you've probably heard like the differences between the Black Lives Matter organization and then like the statement Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. and how some of them is like the violent part is like hijacking the movement. Like I still think the NBA is on the right the right side of that as far as th their intentions, and so I think if they were to take the lead of like I said, meeting with the different experts, saying like, meeting meeting with with some some like police chiefs and saying like, okay, um, how can we be better? This is what we want to see, and then some like psychologist people, some maybe some social work like people, and they all meet and they come up with like. They all have they all have to talk, right? Because right now nobody's talking. I feel like nobody. I feel like, I feel like people aren't talking to each other. I could be wrong, obviously. That there could be a, a being con, con, there could be 
conversations being had behind closed doors. But I feel like that would be that would be the next step. They, the NBA takes this this kind of momentum that they're building, and they go back to their cities and they say, "Hey, we want to meet with the police chief, the mayor, the this city council person, this this person, and this person, and we want to work together to find a solution to the problems that we're seeing." Yeah, yeah, that's those are those real tangible changes that make a difference so like the nba can put black lives matter on their court all they want but like it's not going to incite real change but it the the small change it will make is that like the fans any fans who aren't quote unquote converted will see that all the time and then like slowly believe it but the real tangible change that they can make is like you said going to their city officials and mm-hmm. it's a lot different when you have if you're the police chief of what um let's say minneapolis where mm-hmm. all of this first start not started it started you know um hundreds of years ago but um where it all came to a head right it's different when you have um like lebron james not the lebron james in minneapolis but let's say d'angelo russell carl anthony towns mm-hmm. um other prominent um black athletes in minnesota um coming to your door and telling you what needs to happen rather than a bunch of angry black citizens but you would also need them with the experts right because yeah. like yeah like yeah, yeah. Right, his job is to be a basketball player like he doesn't like unless for whatever reason he does a lot of research in his spare time like he doesn't know mm-hmm. what, what if like he doesn't know what effects his ideas might have so like they need it needs to be in conjunction with these like mm-hmm. these whoever i like i don't I'll keep calling them experts because I haven't really, I'm just like, it's kind of spitballing right now, but they, and it's, and it's different than just tweeting at the mayor saying we need police reform now. It's like, okay, cool. And it's like, they need to get, sit down with everybody needs to sit in the room. And then the pressure of the NBA, the NBA's role in this should be to enact the pressure on the people to make the reforms, not to make the reforms. Yeah, people people care what like LeBron James or all these professional athletes people care what they think mm-hmm. so and all of this these conversations you know players meeting with officials and experts and everyone having these conversations like if that's public knowledge and what's said is you know publicly known and then no change is made, that doesn't look bad on the players. That looks bad on the police department yep. um, or the city. Mm-hmm. So, and that's where the pressure comes in because if, you know, any, if any average Joe does the same thing, there's no pressure. But mm-hmm. LeBron James brings that pressure into your door. Um, when, you know, he has, it's not just him walking in, it's his millions of fans, his millions of followers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's just the power that all of these professional athletes have and they should take advantage of. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I hope we see more of that um, in the coming yeah. Um But like you said, it starts with education, you know, meeting with you know, experts, seeing, you know, what, what can be done, what can reasonably be done, what's the next step in, it, in doing that. Um, because we've seen protests for months. They're great. Keep doing them if you want. But at, like at, at some point, there needs to be like real change being made. And that's, you know, one of the ways you can do that. Yeah. And the other, the other reason why is because a lot of these, the the mayors or whatever, the city council people, the NBA player just goes, Hey, I think we should do this. And like, I don't have to, what do you know about policy? You're just, you're an NBA player. So mm-hmm. to have, to, to have like, to have that like policy expert with you, mm-hmm. to, like that's what, so that's where the credibility for the, concrete change comes from yeah. from the person that's like educated done their research like they like that's their job and then so that's where that credibility comes from and then the other credibility the the pressure of why you should now listen to this person is because you've got the nba guys backing them so yeah. it's so that's what it's got to be and then the nba guys can say to the like policy people hey i think we should do blank blank and blank and they can say well this one might not work but this one sounds good and then maybe we can switch this other one around or tweak it and then okay sounds good we agree now we go to city council and we say 
hey, we want these things done. We've done X, we've found X number of studies that have backed this one and backed this one. And this is why we think we should do this. And then, and then you have the conversation because if the policy guy just goes and be like, well, I don't have to listen to you. And like you, have, like there's no pressure. Like there's like, you don't have a following to make me do it. And with the MBA, it's like, well, I don't have to listen to you. You don't know anything about policy, but if they go together, then it's, then it's like, okay, well, you know stuff about policy and you have all the followings. Okay. So let me listen now. Yeah. And the other thing that the MBA has and the MBA players have is money. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, above all else, the number one influencer in our country. Look at Washington football team wouldn't be named what they are now if it wasn't for FedEx yep. <laughs> pulling their Definitely sponsorship not. or their threat. Um, so not that the NBA is going to, you know, say, if you make these changes, we're going to fund you to police department. That's not how it works. But if the NBA is pushing for these changes and police departments refuse and people don't like that, then money starts to come out of those police. The owners can say, maybe we want to move the team. Yes. Something like that. That too. Yeah. Moving teams takes a ton of money and revenue out of cities. Mm -hmm. So they have power there and there are partnerships that they can do. So if the Lakers want to pay the, or like give money to the Los Angeles police department to establish a position that holds the force accountable, the NBA, you know, they can do that. There's a partnership mm-hmm. that they can have between the city. They can give them a, you know, they can give them this money every year. Um, and that goes towards this dedicated position or positions, this mm-hmm. team that holds the police department accountable. And that um, would almost work yeah. better because the, the team would, if it worked out the way that I think we're both envisioning that the team would be paying those people. So they, they could be more objective in, Hey, you, this, this cop messed up yeah. rather, they, rather they, than they hiding to, it. They can threaten to pull the money and yeah, mm-hmm. it's yeah. Money plays a huge factor and that's what these leagues have. Yeah. I think the NBA is in a good position to do it. I think that would be a good next step. Obviously there's probably more. I'm like, I don't, I don't know, but if the NFL were to follow suit in a similar sort of um, fashion. I think we would be on a really good track to getting somewhere. Um, yeah. But again, the players are just human. They have to want to do it. They have to, and you, you think that most of them do, um, but they have to want to do it and then they have to go make the effort to do it. So yeah. it has to, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, that sounds really promising as, as we, as we just went through it, but who knows? Um, yeah, so you brought up the Washington football team. I know you're a fan of them. You've been a fan of them for, for a while. Unfortunately. How did, how, did you, how did you feel about that when you came? Because when, when, when the news broke that that was the new name, I was like, really? <laughs> it was so funny. So that broke on the same day. So Seattle is getting an NHL team. They're, uh-huh. called, they're the Seattle Kraken. And it was so badass. The name, mm-hmm. the logo, the announcement. Like I, I have never been to Seattle, but like I'm I'm gonna that's gonna be my West Coast team. I'm a Cowboys. Are, are there colors, the navy and green, like the Sounders yeah. and the Seahawks? Yes. That color scheme up there, it just it just fits. It does. It does. And so like, I'm a Capitals fan through and through, but on the West Coast, I'm gonna be a Kraken fan. Yeah. And so that happened, and then not like two hours later. It, they announced Washington football team <laughs> and, and I'm not saying it's not the right move, but why didn't you say club? Why not Washington football club? Like that's like Washington FC. Like that's anyway, that's a, that's a soccer thing. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, that, they don't want to get confused for soccer, I guess. But um, I think to do it right, I think their initial intention was to get it done before the season, mm-hmm. but with they didn't um, expect the trademark problems that they probably were having, and behind the scenes, who knows what Dan Snyder, um, what conversations with Dan Snyder was going on? Because now we've seen report after report of sexual harassment, sexual assault with the team, and so that 
also could have played a factor into them just saying, you know what, hold up, let's just do this for now. Um, and I don't think it's the wrong move. Um, it's I don't think it should be the permanent move. Um, yeah, it's nice though. They are nice. The the numbers on the helmets is is nice. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I'd rather them do this than rush it and do something dumb. I I think their initial plan was to do warriors because that Dan, Snyder, looks good. Dan Snyder pushed for that trademark years ago. And I think preparing for an eventual name change. He did. Uh, that I've seen that a few times. I've seen mm, a report okay. of that a few times. Um, and. And I think when they announced the name change, they were just going to try to seamlessly go for that. Um, but there was a lot of backlash from fans because Warriors is synonymous with Native Americans. Um, the imagery that they would use potentially would be Native American based if they did the spear and the feather. Um, and a lot of fans were like, don't do that. Don't even leave the door open for any interpretation. Just mm -hmm. break away from everything. What they could do is do like military branded warriors. Yeah, um, and they could I, because the Golden State Warriors. I've never, I've never heard yeah. anyone complain about them. Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't think of it either when I first heard it, but like I saw just a lot of negative reaction. Mm -hmm. Because like in the Golden State Warriors, it's not like they were going from uh, a racist name to warriors. No, they just were warriors. So there wasn't that background to kind of influence that thought. Um, so, and I, and I think when Washington started seeing that negative reaction, they were like, pump the brakes. Let's think more about this. Let's do football do team and call it a day. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's a bad move. Um, no. It's better than the alternative of doing the wrong name and then like going through this all over again. Um, I, it's, it does seem silly on the surface it's hard to it's hard to say it's hard to be like i'm a washington football team fan yeah there's, there's no mascot you know i can't say mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a giant fan or something like that mm -hmm. um but i think it's the right move for now well it's weird because in europe the soccer teams they don't like they have mascots but the mascots are not like like manchester united for example you say you're a manchester united fan their mascot is a red devil but you never say i'm a red devils fan yeah. You say I'm a Manchester United fan or I'm a Chelsea fan. Like Chelsea, their mascot, it's like the blues. So it's the same as the Browns. But like, mm -hmm. you just say I'm a Chelsea fan. So they use the city way more than than the mascot itself, which I don't know. It's, it's a weird, I don't know. So for me, I'm like, yeah, I'm a Washington fan. Like, that's pretty normal. You go like, if you're talking about soccer in, in Europe, you just say the city anyways. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's all a cultural thing. You know, it's hard mm -hmm. for us Americans to think that. But um, anyway, like Alabama Crimson Tide, uh, their mascots and all. <laughs> that, so yeah, you just there, say, you just say Bama. That, yeah, yeah. There's examples of that in the U.S., but like yeah, that's a totally cultural thing. Um, and NFL fans are so set in their ways. You know, people are yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah. I still read comments on every Washington Football Team article, and people are like. Um, they're held to the blank. Um, yeah. I'm not going to, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm not going to say the whole name. Um, <laughs> it's okay. But people are like, they're always blank to me. So, mm -hmm. you know, NFL fans are older and set in their ways. So it's harder to accept that um, kind of nameless team. Yeah. Kind of. Especially the ones who have been around since like they were winning, like they won their Super Bowls back in the 90s and 80s. Like, right. Yeah. That's going to be, it's like, Jeez, 1980 was 40 years ago. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, no, that'll definitely be that'll definitely be tough for for people. To, yeah. I think it it'll be weird because it's like it's it, it'll be hard if you make it hard. Like if you are actively if you, if you just like make an, a tiny bit of effort to just be like, yeah, I'm just gonna say Washington or Washington football team. It's like it might take a while, but. Mm -hmm. If you're if like the people that are gonna take forever to do make the change are the ones that are gonna be fighting tooth and nail to continue co to call them the old name. Yeah. So that's a, that's another weird. It's like this comes with the like this became a political issue. It didn't have to be a political issue. It should have just been all right. We'll change the name because it's ignorant or whatever, and then it should have just been done with. But yeah. 
Trump is like, they shouldn't change the name. And now all of a sudden it's a yep. right versus left issue. And so you have people who have, I, I know people who know nothing about football, don't really care about football, who are livid that they changed the name. And I'm like, mm-hmm. why? You don't know, any, you don't care yeah. about football. You don't care. You just care. Just, that shows you the power of the president. Imagine if Trump had come out and said, good on Washington, they should have changed the name, yada, yada, yada. Imagine how little that voice would be um, of the people who support the name. Yeah, like, it, would, it would be a lot smaller. Yeah. I think, I think there would still be that pocket of people that think it's dumb to change the name, but it would definitely be smaller. Like you, like it, or if he just hadn't said anything, like it wouldn't be on people's radar. Like people yeah. who weren't paying attention, but now since he tweeted about it, whenever he, whenever he did, I'm sure he did, you could probably find one. But now it's on people's radar that weren't paying attention to it before. And instead of being at, it being on their radar in a positive way, like you were saying, now it's on their radar in a negative sense. They changed the name and then LeBron tweets, well, that's not very creative or whatever. He's like, I bet that meeting took a while or whatever he said. You know, it's just like faith pump. And then somebody replied and was like, you literally named your son the same name as yourself. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah it's just weird it's weird like everything everything on twitter feels like it has to be a gotcha yeah no that's true yeah everyone's trying to you know get that singer mm-hmm. on the other it, I, it's just weird <laughs> i don't even know all right so the nba when when are they playing the did they reschedule those games yet the three that yeah, were they're, postponed they're starting today i think the first game actually is playing now Oh, cool. So, okay, so let's run down the playoffs. So, Boston is playing Toronto. Yeah. Who you got in that one? Oof. That's so, that's the toughest one, I think, of all of them. I'm going to say Toronto. You got Toronto? Why? I, I think, well, first of all, Boston's not going to have Gordon Hayward for a little bit. He yep. hurt his ankle. Yeah, he hurt his ankle. But I also, I also don't think Gordon Hayward makes the Celtics that much better. I think they got to trade him. He's their most expensive player. Um, but it was so unfortunate because he played five minutes for them before he, before his ankle before that injury. Dude, remember we were watching that live when it happened? We did that oh, was man. we were sitting we were sitting on our house, Chris mm-hmm. and I back. I think well, we were, we had just graduated college. We were sitting in our house and like I was making dinner or something. Chris was watching watching the game, mm-hmm. and I hear like you like shout from another room I'm like, "Dude, come look at this!" And like I see his like his ankle like. Yeah. And I was like, why did you call me over here? Now I don't want to eat anymore. But they, <laughs> like, if he had stayed healthy, I also don't think we would have had, we, that we would have the Jason Tatum that, and yeah. Jalen Brown that we do now. So, yeah. So it's, so it's unfortunate, but he's our highest paid player, but fourth best player. So, yeah. but so I'll, I'd go, I picked Toronto there. They're, they got the confidence and experience from last year, and they have the best coach in the league. So they do. Nick Nurse is a good coach. Brad Stevens is no slouch, though. To, uh, yeah, I think, think not. He, Brad Stevens is also phenomenal, but I think uh, you're probably splitting hairs coaching wise. It's a seven game series. I think so. I have Boston personally. I think, I think Tatum, I think Tatum will be the difference because at the other positions, you have matchups that you can kind of see like, like Kimba Walker versus Kyle Lowry is kind of splitting hairs, I think. Each of them on their day is better than the other one. Mm-hmm. And then, like Siakam, I don't really know. I don't really know who would guard Siakam. Uh, Brown, Tatum. Tatum or Brown, maybe. Yeah. Um, but I don't know who on Toronto guards Tatum. If they put whoever they put on Brown, or like, I don't. Do they have the wing defenders to handle both of them? See, that's the thing. I don't know. I mean, like Fred Van Fleet. Um, Van Fleet's small, but is, he's like six one, isn't he? Yeah. Um, so Tatum is what six six eight, and Brown is six seven, six eight as well. Yeah. So that's that's gonna be a tough matchup. Um, and that's so that's my edge is like Tatum's young and he was inconsistent a little bit this year and in the playoffs so far. But um, if he's on, it's Boston. If he's yeah. off, it's Toronto. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Normally in yeah. those matchups, I tend to err on the side of they're going to play well, which is why I pick, which is why I pick Boston. Yeah. So 
I think I think we're probably on the same page. I think a lot rides on Tatum because if Tatum if Tatum is playing like how like at his or close to his best, I don't really think. I think Boston. I'm, if Tatum plays at his best for the whole series, I think Boston wins in six, not even not, not even in seven. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I mean, Kyle Lowry obviously, and Siakam. Depend if Siakam turns it on as well. Then if if they both play well, then then we could be in for a really good series. So. The other thing you got to think about is everything going on right now, like mentally, it, it's hard. Like, like with, mentally, who's going to be better, yeah. Yeah, so like you're isolated in a bubble, boycotts and protests going on. I, I think maturity and experience are going to prevail because the young athletes might be a little bit more frazzled and mm-hmm. their minds are yeah. and everything. So that's where I'm picking an older, experienced team like Toronto versus a younger team. Yeah, that's fair. Then we got – Miami, Milwaukee. Assuming so, Milwaukee's still playing their series against the Magic. I think that's the game going on right now, or at least in the yeah, I, they're so, up three one. Aren't they? Yeah, huh? they're yeah, up three one, aren't they? Yeah. One, yeah. Um, in that series again. I'm Heat going. I'm good. going Miami because I'm a Miami I know, fan. I know you are. That's just they played. They look so good against Indiana. We did. But, we looked really good. I watched three of the four games. Duncan pick, Rob- Do you remember I, we watched Duncan Robinson live when he was playing at Williams? Oh my gosh, yes. Before he transferred to Michigan. He was yeah. a freshman. He was a freshman at Williams. We watched him play. They <laughs> they killed us. I forgot about that. Oh we my actually God. we actually didn't play bad that game. We had a lot of good I remember yeah. being like we had a lot of good looks. We just didn't hit them. Because we were yeah. live by the three, die by the three. In that game, we died by the three. <laughs> well, think about the day before, like in the D3 tournament, you don't have days off. No. Right? You play back-to-back. And the mm-hmm. day before was just that emotionally – Oh, the Virginia Wesleyan game. Virginia Wesleyan. That game, I'll never forget. It mm-hmm. was just – Nope. It was so gritty. It was so hard. 78, I, I, 74. I, I literally was screaming so loud, uh, my nose started bleeding. With like two I minutes remember left, that. With like two minutes left in the game, I ran up to the bathroom. Stop and I, I remember that we were sitting in the front row. It took you forever to get back down because we were yelling the whole game. I didn't have a voice after that. That was uh, that was the peak of college. So, yeah, 78, 74 year. win. Then we go play Duncan Robinson's D three team. <laughs> they killed us. They um, killed us on the scoreboard. We died by the three. Like we had been, we shot lights out from three all year, and then that game we just didn't hit. They're tired, man. That yeah. game before took everything out of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. I don't know if Duncan Robbins is enough to take down Giannis. No, definitely not. But <laughs> on the other hand, Jimmy Butler is looking very good. All, yeah. all, all of a sudden, he's hitting some threes, which he hadn't all year. Uh, Tyler Hero is looking good. Drogic is looking good. Bam is looking good. The thing with, the thing with Miami is Bam can move, and he's big enough to stay with Giannis. Like he's not he's not gonna he's not gonna shut him down because nobody's gonna shut Giannis down, but Middleton is playing like garbage, and Bledsoe's playing like garbage. Yeah, and those are the other two guys they have. So I feel like we'll just we'll let Giannis get his, and we'll just shut everybody else down. And I think we have more firepower. I think it'll look a lot like the Clippers and Mavericks right now. It'll be an ugly six or seven game series win from Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be all Giannis who gets it done. Just like right now for the Clippers, they, if you just look on paper, you'd think Mavericks are crushing them, but it's tied 2-2. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kawhi is carrying the team because Paul George, outside of one game, has stunk. Yeah, um, he's been horrible. And they called, they called him Pandemic P. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we're going to be talking about it like that. It's gonna The Heat are going to look like the better team, but Giannis is going to carry – his sluggish. Yeah. Over. Well, I really hope that Dallas pulls it out. I don't think they will because because uh, Luca's ankle is probably toast. But um, yeah. But yeah, I hope. I don't know. The thing with I think Miami is a better team than Dallas, and I think the Clippers are a worse team. I meant the the Bucks are a worse team than the Clippers. Mm-hmm. So if it is that way, I think the gap is small smaller enough. Like. If the series had gone exactly how the Dallas Clippers series had gone, I would say Miami's up 3-1 instead of being 2-2. Yeah. So, 
if it does go that way and the thing like jimmy butler is like he's just got this like personality about him that he doesn't want to lose yeah that, and you know, I, he, he'll carry that team far you know and you can see that everyone's bought in mm-hmm. to his um his playing style his leadership style and the other thing is about carrying them he doesn't have to carry all the scoring weight because oh, yeah, he because so because bam can get his Hero can get his. Duncan Robinson, you get him five open threes, he's hitting four of them. Mm-hmm. Dragic, Dragic can get his. Like, I can name probably of those five or six players, it would not be implausible to see any of them just happen to have a 30-point game. Right. Yeah. It, they're so, game. I, I think the loss of Malcolm Brogdon for the Bucks hurt – and they're More. gonna feel, they're gonna feel that now because in playoff time your depth is revealed, mm-hmm. and they're gonna feel that in this series because they're not deep at guard, um, no. and they and Heat have a lot of good shooters. So mm-hmm. Malcolm Brogdon, um, he's not a big name, but he's an amazing defender, mm-hmm. and he can go get points. So and I think this is a series where that'll be exposed for Milwaukee, or or even Olenek, also, yeah, can go get you a twenty point game. Because they're all shooters. Yeah. Like, all their 20-point games are, like, 8 for 12 shooting, like, 4 for 6 from 3. Like, mm-hmm. they do it, like, we, like, we score efficiently a lot. Yeah. And, and you're so, not afraid either. You're not intimidated. No. And, and Spo, Eric Spolster is a good coach as well. So, oh, yeah. So, like, we had, our, we had our down years after when Dwayne Wade was getting old and LeBron left, but the trade to get Jimmy Butler, like, I was kind of sad that we had to let Josh Richardson go, but he hasn't been that good for Philly. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I don't I know. I, won, I think he won that trade. Yeah, I really, I mean, most, most like, 99 times out of 100, whoever gets the, the best player in the deal wins the trade. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. I'm really liking the look of, of the Miami team. So, I'm, I don't know. We'll see. So, then in the West, Dallas and the Clippers are at 2-2 still. Are they playing today? I think they are. Hmm. Yeah. Who, you, who you got in that one? I feel like the Clippers are going to pull it out. As much as I want Dallas to pull it out, I think the Clippers will. I think it's the Clippers, I think, without Porzingis um, and with a hobbled Luka. Mm. Uh, it was an amazing performance that one game, but – Clippers in the last game were just so dominant. Yeah, they were. I mean, they were sleeping all over the first few games, and they turned their focus on it. So I, I think it, if they don't close it out in six, they'll win it in seven. Yeah. Um, they're, I think the Clippers are going to, you know, they're, they're just, they're gonna get together. They're just better. Um, do you, did you watch game one of that series? No. So the first, the first like, ten minutes or eight minutes or so, the Clippers were up 18 to two. And the defense, Luca had like four turnovers in the first like six, seven minutes. The, the defense was looking insane. And I was like, wow, the Clippers really just turned it on. And then Luca settled in. They came back. They took the lead at one point. That was that stupid game that Porzingis got ejected for that super soft ejection. And they ended up losing by like six or eight. And I was talking to one of my other friends and I was like, Porzingis gets ejected like part in the middle of the game, either late second or early third quarter. You would think that he would make up eight points off yeah. on the on the offensive or defensive end, right? He alters a couple shots, makes a couple tough shots that somebody else doesn't make. You think he alters that game um, by eight points, and you're looking at that like they could have been up three one, and then Luca hurts his ankle, still drops like forty whatever ridiculous stat line he drops, and it's like it's only two two. Mm-hmm. Like you would think that they would like you were like you were saying earlier, you'd think by how they're playing that they'd be up more. But I think the like Kawhi I don't know. It's weird it's weird that Luca's been able to score so, like score so easily when they have the two like you would say probably the three best backcourt defenders, three of the top yeah. five and Paul George, Kawhi and Pat Beverly, and he's dropping forty like it's nothing. Yeah. 
Uh, and so they'll be back next year for sure. They will. They and I think they just need like not one more star, but like one more good role player. They so either need Hardaway to take that next step to get to like an eighteen yeah. point a game score, or they need to grab somebody else um, who's going to be in that that sort of role. I really hope Luca and Porzingis both stay healthy and stay together because I think they can be what Dirk and Steve Nash never were. Yes, that, that well. That I think, duo is excites me so much. It does, and I think it excites it, is, it excites Mark Cuban as well, who's. Yeah. I like Mark Cuban, to be honest. Like, not not just Shark Tank, but because on Shark Tank he can be kind of a kind of a jerk sometimes. But like, <laughs> just generally how he is when he's like he doesn't come across like when like the clothes he wears. He wears jeans and t-shirts. Like you would not yeah. think that. And like like he comes across like if you just saw him on the street, like and you didn't know who he was, like you wouldn't be like billionaire. Yeah. And yeah, that he's, that's really he's cool. Down to earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I think Luca could be better than Steve Nash, though. I think so too. I hate I, to say it because Steve Nash was like my my OG uh, favorite. Yeah. Uh, but I think Luca will surpass him. In yeah. Terms, like, especially if he wins a title, because Steve Nash never won a title. So. No. Yeah. Exactly. I think he's a better like to say he's a better scorer than Nash is. If you need a bucket at the end of the game, you're gonna take Luca. Yeah. Than than Nash. Like Nash got his in transition, and he got his off pick and rolls and other stuff. But if you need somebody to go get you a bucket, Luca Luca's gonna go get you a bucket. Yeah. But all right. So who else is left in the West? Yeah, Lakers, Trailblazers, three one. And and Lillard is hurt. So. <laughs> no Lillard. So. So that's a wrap. Um. And then. We got. Why, why am I blanking? We've got Nuggets and Jazz. Is it? That is, is that Jazz two, two? Up, it's Jazz are up three two. Jazz are up three two. Ooh. They were up three one, but the Nuggets forced a game six. Do you think the Jazz close it out or the Nuggets come back? I don't know. I I want to like the Nuggets on paper are so much better. Mm-hmm. But the Jazz got up three one for a reason. Yeah, it's because Donovan honestly, Mitchell's been playing out of his mind. Yeah, but the thing that Jazz have been lacking were leadership, and they have that with Mike Conley now. Um, and I think that's been the difference in the playoffs and why they're um, playing so much better than a clearly better Nuggets team. Mm-hmm. So I think I think the Jazz close it out. Yeah, um, I think – It took a Herculean effort by Jamal Murray to even stay alive. If, if you watch anything – Go, oh yeah, yeah. Go watch Jamal Murray's like last five minutes of yeah. Game five. He was, was a walking was, bucket. It was insane. Um, but he's not going to do that for two more games, so it's going to be no. Jazz. No, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Was well, going. I don't. I think the Jazz go out next round, though. I don't think either of these teams wins the next round, no matter who they play. Like even if they're playing Dallas, I think Dallas beats both teams. To be honest, um, I don't yeah. know. It, like this matchup is just one of those where it's like you slug it out and then just lose the next round yeah um who's the who's the last one i'm blanking too so it it would be i think the clippers if it plays out the way we think it would be clippers playing the jazz Mm -hmm. and the lakers they're playing oh rockets thunder oh yeah yeah rockets Thunder. that's two two isn't russ gonna be back for game five i think russ is back yeah. yeah, so I think the Rockets probably pull that one out. I just, I just, I just don't think the Thunder have enough. The Thunder won two in a row. And yeah, I, but I've thought the same thing. I've thought all year they don't have enough. Um, and that's the thing about Russell Westbrook coming back. He's one of those guys that's like, he doesn't automatically make your team better. When they're playing the right way, he makes them better. But they got up two nothing without him. Yeah, so that's true. It, it's you know. He's a firecracker. It's, you know, he can be destructive or, you know, just what you need. So. I think both right. of those teams lose in the next round also, no matter who wins. I don't know. I think, Against the Lakers? I think the – so think about the Rockets when they are on. Um, for the sake of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Rockets in seven. Okay. Yeah, um, I, can, I can get behind that. 
And think about the Rockets. They're basically a souped up trailblazer team. Um, they are a guard heavy three point shooting fast break team. Mm -hmm. Um, that doesn't really play great defense. Um, and the Trailblazers gave the Lakers a little bit of trouble, so I think the Rockets could give the Lakers a little bit more trouble. As, again, assuming everyone's working together as they should. Yeah. Um, but I think James Vance is too much, though. I, I, I agree. Um, He's going to get tired. I, I would pick Lakers in six in that game, in that series, but in a – in a perfect world, not a perfect world, but like if the Rockets are playing at their best, I think they have a better shot of beating the Lakers than the Thunder. Yeah, 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 I agree with that. I, mean, I think I'd rather see the Thunder play though because they're fun to watch and they're such a great team. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing LeBron and Chris Paul play against each other would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, just like watching LeBron and Carmelo play against each other is fun right now. Yeah, I need to catch that last game, that game five. Is that is that tomorrow, today, or tomorrow? I think it's today. Uh, yeah, sit there tomorrow. I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I need to catch that last that, that game. Yeah. Could be but, tomorrow's last. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? That'll be once once that whole class, because Bosch is a Bosch already retired, but once that whole kind of 04, 05, or 03, 04, and then 04, 05 classes are, are done. So, like, when Chris Paul's done, LeBron's done, Melo's done, Bosch is done, Wade's done. Uh, Dwight Howard, like when that whole class is kind of done, that'll be like the era. Like it's already shifting, but yeah, that'll be like the final one because LeBron is still so good, so it still feels like they're all around, kind of. Mm -hmm. But all right, so then we'll go Rockets, Lakers. I think Lakers, Lakers. and six. Just think they're they're too big. They're too big yeah. and LeBron is too good. And if they start PJ Tucker at the five, who's gonna guard Anthony Davis? Right. Um then And you have Jazz Clippers. Jazz Clippers. Clippers are Clippers are too good as well. Because the difference between Luca and Donovan Mitchell, Luca's bigger and his game is a little bit more polished, based less on a, off athleticism and more just on like skill set and against a yeah. defender like a Kawhi or uh, Pat Beverly or Paul George, Luca's Luca's offensive game is uniquely well suited to going against defenders like that. I, I think anyways. Yeah. yeah so I, I think agree. so I think Donovan Mitchell will have a lot more trouble um than Luca did. It's a much better matchup for the Clippers and I think, you know, after they find their groove in the first round, I think they carry that. I think it's like a five game yeah, yeah, I think so too. And then, all right, so then we got Lakers Clippers in the conference finals. Who you got? I I was avoiding that one. <laughs> uh, I want to say Clippers. Um, I don't know. I just I did Kawhi. Um, uh -huh. I, like, I like his style of just like focus. But with everything that went on this year with the pandemic and Kobe, I, I just. I can't root against the Lakers. Like, mm -hmm. I want to. I grew up not liking these, you know, the dominant teams like the Lakers. Mm -hmm. I didn't like LeBron going there because it was just like whatever. But I don't know. I think, I think that's a better story. I wanted Kawhi to stay in Toronto. I think that was just like the perfect place yeah. for him. And when he went through Clippers and kind of forced Paul George there, I was like, whatever. Yeah. Um, I just I think the Lakers are you know fun to watch. So. It would be that would be the Lakers were to win. I think that would be a very good way, a better yeah. way to end the year. My the my thing, thing is like I know what LeBron winning another championship. I know what it means. It means people are gonna say he's the goat, and mm. I don't think he's the goat. And I don't want to have to hear that constantly. Um, <laughs> so I want I like it'd be cool for him to win a championship, but I don't. <laughs> I don't want to hear the debate. I don't. No, well, I mean, you just want them to win because of Kobe, really, more than anything. Yeah. I think mean, um, that'd, that'd be cool. And honestly, like, like when the season – before the pandemic, that's, like, all I could think about. But then, like, everything else that's gone on since, um, since his death, like, it's almost an afterthought. Mm -hmm. uh, when, like, the Lakers winning the championship the same year Kobe dies, that should be, like, front of mind. Yeah. I forget all the time. 
that Kobe died this year. Like, mm-hmm. if it's just crazy. But um, yeah, that that would be that's my rooting interest. Um, so I'd say the Lakers in seven. All right, so back to the East. So are we? <laughs> no, we were we were uh, we were uh, against each other on Milwaukee, Miami. Miami. Milwaukee, Miami. Um, so, so I'm taking Miami. You got Milwaukee. Yeah. All right, and then the other one. Oh, we're both we're against each other with that one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's let's take your let's take yours first. So Toronto, Milwaukee. Who you got? Toronto, Milwaukee. I would say Toronto. I think they're deeper. Mm-hmm. And I think they learned last year how to beat Giannis. And I don't think Giannis has a help around him. Yeah. At the guard position, at the forward position, the you know, the way um Toronto can rebound and stretch the floor. Mm-hmm. I I would take Toronto. In All right. In seven. Yeah, that would definitely that would definitely go to the wire, I think. All right, if it's Miami Boston, who you got? Boston. Yeah, I do too. As as a as a fan, I was like, yeah, Miami. I think I think Boston beats Milwaukee as well. If it gets to that, I think they have more scoring options. I think Miami Boston would be the most fun series to watch as far as free flowing not hack a Giannis basketball Mm -hmm. um free flowing anybody can like both teams have five five person lineups that where everybody can score Mm -hmm. um like Derek Jones Jr. doesn't get like dude can score too like we'll put him at the five and we'll run super small and everybody can score and Boston can do the same I think that would be the most fun to watch but yeah I think Boston would probably win all right so Wow, it would be really fitting if it was Lakers, Boston in the championship, and then the Lakers yeah. won. I don't know. All right, so we'll go Milwaukee for, or you said Toronto. So we'll go Lakers, Toronto first. You got you do do you have LA? Yeah, I got Lakers. That that sounds like a six game. Yeah, do you have the Lakers no matter who gets out of the East? See, I think if Milwaukee makes it to the finals, um. See, that's a weird thing. If Milwaukee makes it to the finals, I would pick Milwaukee. But yeah. I don't think Milwaukee makes it to the finals. Um, but They just match up better. They match up better. And, you know, if Milwaukee gets out of the East, that tells me that they're playing their best basketball. And if they're playing mm-hmm. their best basketball, they beat the Lakers. But I don't trust Milwaukee to play their best basketball in the playoffs. I don't trust the help around Giannis, um, which is why I have them out. Um, talking about who we have, either Boston or Toronto, I think I think it's Lakers. Um, yeah. The experience they have over Boston and the, um, the the size and star power they have over Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All right. So final final finals prediction with who you got? Uh, Lakers over. I'd say Lakers over. Um, Toronto in six. You heard it here first. Thanks for being on, Chris. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate it. We just did like almost two hours. It's crazy. <laughs> it's been a that, great that episode. That went by fast. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like it when when you're talking. Um, when you're just going through. I just looked at the clock. It's like it's two thirty already. So, yeah. any last nuggets from you? No. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll end it there. Yes. Bye. Bye, yeah. everybody. Was, yeah. Love you, Eric. Thanks for having me. For sure.